good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our talk, A Year in the Red. Um, so our talk today is discussing some of the advances in red team tactics that have come to light over the past 12 or so months. Um, we've tried to cover a broad range of areas, starting from the outside with recon and infiltration, through to establishing C2 and lateral movement. Um, we'll talk about some of the things that we've found most interesting, including the tools and techniques released by other researchers, as well as some of the tools that we've developed in-house and that have proved useful to us in our engagements. Um, so there will be a few tools that we've, uh, we'll talk about through um, our presentation. Most of them are available on our GitHub page. Um, so my name's Dominic Chow, I work for a company called MDSEC, um, where I've overall, got overall responsibility for the company's CBEST, Star, and Red Team services. Um, this is the third time I've spoken at Hack in the Box, so thank you for uh, welcoming me back. Um, yeah, I'm Vincent Yu, and I work alongside Dominic on the Active Breach team at MDSEC. Um, yeah, this is my first Hack in the Box talk and um, conference, actually. Welcome. <laughs> um, so from our perspective, um, over the past few years, we've noticed much, much more focus being paid to red team exercises. In particular, over the past 12 months or so as a company, we've had a lot more clients coming to us asking us about red team over traditional penetration testing. I'm not sure exactly why this is, but I suspect it's partly to do with buy-in from the regulators. So we've seen the development of structured frameworks that provide a more formal approach to conducting red team simulations. So we've now got things like um, the CBEST scheme in the UK, that's backed by the Bank of England, the FCA and the NCSC. We've got equivalents in other countries such as the TIB scheme over in Netherlands, which is backed by the Central Bank of Netherlands. And we've got the ICAST scheme over in Hong Kong. Um, so like yin and yang, as red teaming becomes more prominent, so does um, blue teaming. Advances in defensive controls, the wider adoption of sandboxing, technologies such as Microsoft ATA, LAPS, Device Guard, Credential Guard, as well as the rise of threat hunting, that is, um, teams that are proactively and iteratively searching through networks looking for threats are making red teaming considerably harder. So as such, the red team must evolve. And that was really the inspiration for this talk, because we believe there's been some really interesting developments over the past 12 to 18 months. So I'm going to pass you over to Vincent, who will talk about some of the tools that we've developed in the area of recon. So traditionally, reconnaissance has been performed against organizations to sort of understand what the target's physical presence is, their regional presence, and um, you know, just to sort of understand more about a target organization before you begin the infiltration phase. Um, so one thing that kept cropping up for us was email collection. So a lot of the time we would have to collect emails for a target organization um, for use in like spear phishing or password spring attacks against um, external infrastructure. Um, so traditionally, email collection is being performed using uh, search engines like Google and Bing, maybe social media like Twitter and Facebook, unlikely because in enterprise environments you're less likely to find uh, email addresses in personal uh, social media like Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn is the more prominent one, so we're going to talk about that a bit more here. So um, email collection is, be uh, yeah, is quite prominent and why is it? Okay. So yeah, we're just going to focus on LinkedIn here, and I'll talk a bit about why. So on the left, uh, yeah, on the left here, you can see that you can see my name and my title at MDSEC, the uh, university I went to, and the company I work at, and uh, my sort of like geographical location as well. So that's uh, that's Im that's important information when you're trying to narrow down a a targets. Uh, a list of targets to a specific region. If, say, for example, I only wanted to target the UK presence as opposed to, like, say, Asia, learn that will come in handy. Um, additionally, on LinkedIn, you can search by the company name. So, if you search, for example, here, General Motors, we can um, then click on the company's profile page, and you can see like there's actually a link on the page which allows you to like click on and, uh, and see all of their employees. So that that filtering helps. Um, to save us having to do the filtering ourselves. Um, so the issue here, LinkedIn is great, but a lot of the tools we found were broken. Um, so mainly due to user interface updates over the past year and some tools we're using, um, like LinkedIn, the LinkedIn API, which was throttled. So we went ahead and developed a tool called LinkedIn. Um, this was meant to streamline the collection process. 
So ideally, I'd want to just give it a, a company name and a domain, and five minutes later, I'll have a nice list of uh, email addresses for that target organization. So this is based off um, Danny Crastel's scraper. Um, so like I've said, I've like, fixed the UI issues, and I've also implemented um, uh, email format prediction using the Hunter um, API. Um, so here's a quick demo of the LinkedIn tool. So here we're running the tool, and we begin by putting in the target company's name and start filling out the sort of options. Um, here I put generalmotors.com because I thought that was General Motors' domain, but then I soon found out that it's actually gm.com, so go ahead and fix that. Um, yep, yeah, let's put auto to automatically perform the um, prefix detection. And then it begins scraping. So here we can see like there's some headless profiles found. That's um, due to the fact that the account that I'm using on LinkedIn doesn't have a third degree connection to the target, so it can't see that profile. So, so, so sort of like improve these results, you can begin connecting with people within that organization because they're more likely to be connected in some way to another employee, uh, and that'll like improve the results there. So it outputs two formats. Uh, there's a HTML report which sort of gives you like the image, um, like a profile photo, the title and location. So that's great for you know just scrolling through and having a look at people's photos. But we've got um, a another format, a CSV format as well. So this is uh, more handy for um, penetration testers and the search because uh, you can then just click and start filtering by location or title, removing um, people that you don't want to fish or um, target. And then, um, yeah, you can just uh, select the column and cut and paste it into a text file for importing into other tools. So um, now Dominic's going to talk a bit about infiltration. Um, so infiltration is sometimes one of the hardest parts of a red team exercise. Um, traditionally, a lot of focus has been on things like phishing. Um, but this tactic is, is often closely watched by um, the blue team. So unless you're creating a particularly low noise targeted spear phishing campaign, there's, there's potential for you to get spotted. So we were particularly interested in other vectors to target corporate networks aside from phishing. Although I do have to admit, in some cases, it may just be as simple as sending your target a carefully crafted uh, phishing email, asking them to run a Python command on the terminal of their MacBook. However, as we found out in this case, uh, even this isn't foolproof as we ended up providing tech support to poor old Colin when we encountered issues with the version of Python OpenSSL that was on his Mac when we were trying to run our payload. Um, so there's been some really interesting developments in targeting exchange environments over the past 12 months, as well as some really impressive tooling that has been released. Um, so particularly, there's been tools like um, MailSniper and Ruler, which can be used to perform password getting attacks against Exchange, as well as, um, in some cases, inject arbitrary OWA rules to gain code execution on a user's workstation. Um, with this in mind, we started to think about some of the other services that are exposed um, and also integrated into Active Directory. And one that kind of kept, crept, kept cropping up to us was um, Link or Skype for Business. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't actually find any real kind of research targeting these services. Um, so Skype for Business, or Microsoft Link as it was formerly known, typically comes in one of two flavors. Um, that is using an on-premise um, Skype for Business server, or the, a hosted um, cloud-based federated um, Skype for Business installation. Fortunately um, for us, kind of identifying whether an organization is using Skype for Business is actually relatively trivial, because um, the, the service actually supports the concept of auto-discovery. So that is, um, there'll typically be um, certain DNS entries um, on the target domain, things like link discover dot whatever the company's domain is, or link discover internal dot whatever the company's domain is. Um, aside from that, the services that the um, Skype for Business supports are actually relatively distinctive. They've got relatively distinctive service banners, so you can quickly find them on things like Showdom. Um, so we were particularly interested in how widespread Skype for Business deployments were. So we ran a quick DNS enumeration across the Alexa top 1 million. We found that roughly 26% of them were using Skype for Business, and of that, 3.7% were using Office 365. 
So as I mentioned, because Sky for Business typically integrates into AD, um, we believe this might provide a useful opportunity to identify AD credentials from the internet. But unfortunately, there were no real tools around to communicate with these services. And this led to the development of um, an in-house tool, and it's now available on our GitHub page, uh, called Link Sniper. Uh, so Link Sniper can be used to target um, Skype for Business services. Um, one of the first things we need to do when developing Link Sniper was really kind of understand how the authentication works. And what we found was um, that Skype for Business actually supports um, NTLM, Kerberos, and OAuth authentication. Um, the one that appeared to work uh, the easiest for us was OAuth, um, and this was, uh, it was actually relatively straightforward to implement. Um, so there wasn't any real documentation on this, but we found that um, as long as you provide um, a certain post request to the Skype for Business service with a grant type of password, then it actually is just a case of um, supplying a username and password, which is, was relatively straightforward to implement. But given the service also supports um, NTLM and Kerberos, there's also potential to do things like um, pass the hash and pass the ticket type attacks against Skype for Business. Um, so we implemented that into uh, Link Sniper, and it, it worked relatively well um, against our on-premise services. Um, but what we quickly found was that um, th this OAuth type isn't actually supported in Office 365. Office 365 uses um, WS Trust and um, RST authentication. So these are the core uh, fundamental protocols that are used by um, Microsoft's security token services and ADFS. Um, but this, again, was relatively well documented on MSDN. So we were able to implement this into Link Sniper. And that basically gave us a tool that we were able to use to perform password spraying, password brute force attacks against um, Skype for Business um, environments. And we're also currently working on um, some additional functionality, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. But first, I'll give you um, a quick demo of the tool. So um, Link Sniper is implemented as um, a PowerShell module. Um, and there's a number of commandlets. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly show you that I've got a, a text file just with a bunch of uh, kind of email addresses in for our organization. And we're going to spray the password uh, welcome one against this, um, the MDSEC company. So the first thing Link Sniper does is it will um, do the auto discovery and find the relevant uh, authentication endpoints for Skype for Business. Um, it will then basically spray the welcome one password against all the enumerated email addresses. So if you've used something like the LinkedIn tool that Vincent demonstrated, you've done your email collection, you can then spray a password against um, all those emails and, and figure out, and in this case, uh, Link Snipers identified one for the joe.blogs user at mdset.co.uk, and it's told us that that's a valid set of credentials. So we could now use that credentials to kind of get access to the guy's um, Sky for Business um, environment. So while describing um, Skype authentication, I briefly mentioned um, federation, but I didn't actually explain what it is. Um, so officially, it's a way of providing single sign-on across trust boundaries, but unofficially, it's a way of exposing Active Directory to the internet, which from an offensive perspective is actually pretty awesome. So essentially what um, you can do with federated services is you can share the identity of someone within your organization with your trusted business partners. Now that might be um, from one domain to another, i.e. Uh, company A to company B, or it could be from one company to Microsoft themselves. This would, this would then allow you to do things like um, use cloud services such as Office 365 with your internal AD. Um, so why is this interesting and why is this relevant to Skype? Well, when we started to look at um, how some of the attacks against Skype for Business were performed, we discovered this kind of really interesting option in the um, Office 365 admin panel. So under this uh, kind of external communications tab, there was um, an option saying um, public IM connectivity, let people use Skype for Business to communicate with Skype users outside of your organization. So what does this mean? Well, um, basically it means is if I've got um, federated authentication turned on and um, another company has, that means that I can actually just go ahead and talk to any of their users. Um, and this is this has proved really useful to us during red team exercises because we've basically been able to um, directly talk to uh, employees within a company without actually having a um, an account within their um, uh, Office 365 environment. Um, so it also allows us to do other things aside from kind of um, direct IM based spear phishing. We can also do things like user enumeration, so we can verify whether email addresses are, are correct or not. Um, we can actually gain presence whether a user is online at a given time, which is also useful if we're doing things like a physical red team exercise. Um, so what we actually did to abuse this was we went and created a, um, a new account on Office 365 called Skype Support. And um, using this Skype Support account on the kind of left hand side, 
Um, so this is the kind of view that the attacker would get. We were actually able to send messages to, uh, in this case, the, the MDSEC organization, uh, to this Joe Bloggs user. And this is what the Joe Bloggs user would see. He would basically see he's got an IM coming in saying, you know, there's been a Skype update. You need to kind of download and run this, this uh, executable. And if you, if you were looking at it from this perspective, and this, as I say, this is what the kind of the victim would see, there's not too much to give it away that um, that, that user isn't part of um, Skype or part of his organization, except for this uh, little area here that says um, external network. And that's basically the only uh, distinguishing factor that shows that he's not part of the MDSEC organization. Uh, and if he wanted to kind of drill down into the contact, he could actually see what email address the um, user was created with or what the email address the account had. Uh, and in this case, what we actually did was um, we found like a Microsoft domain that had just expired and we went and registered it. Um, so basically, if he did look into that, he would actually see that it's a, it's, it's a valid Microsoft domain. So kind of moving on from infiltration, but in a, in a relatively similar area. And we'll talk about some of the things that we've seen develop from the perspective of defensive evasion. So these are tricks that have come to light for evading specific security products or blue team monitoring tactics. So as the first line of defense, um, the corporate web proxy is often a good place to kind of firm up your um, controls. And one of the controls that we often see organizations implement to limit the sites that can be accessed through their proxy is the concept of categorization. A lot of companies consider categorization to be a security boundary. We don't. Um, so what does categorization do? Well, effectively, it allows you to black hole um, unknown or uncategorized sites or restrict um, users to accessing only sites of a certain category. So, for example, you could configure your proxy to, say, maybe only allow users to access business sites. Um, they could block sites of a certain category. Maybe you don't want users to access um, like adult sites or sites containing profanity. You can do that with categorization. Now, that is obviously a problem if you're a red team. Because um, if you're trying to coerce a user into accessing your phishing site, or um, maybe you want to kind of get egress out to your C2 channel, um, it actually means that the, uh, the host that you're using, the site that you're using, needs to be categorized. So the traditional approach to kind of evading this is using tools like Cat My Fish or Domain Hunter, which will basically allow you to find sites that have already been categorized and that are just expiring and available for purchase. <clears throat> The problem with this is um, that you can't actually often find target relevant sites. So say, for example, we were targeting something like, um, like Bank of America. We couldn't, say, for example, go and register like, or find a site saying like bankofamericaservices.com. So we couldn't find something that was particularly tailored to that organization. So what we started to do was actually um, do some research on how categorization was implemented, how the proxy services were actually determining uh, the, the relevant category for certain sites. And we found some weaknesses in this implementation, and we went on to develop a tool called Chameleon, which we'll uh, demonstrate for you. Um, so what we found was that in some cases, the sites didn't actually even have to exist because of the bugs in the categorization sites. So in this case, we've um, like registered a new domain, um, and we've been able to categorize it as uh, banking on IBM X-Force's category site. So basically, that means that anybody who's using one of these IBM um, proxies will actually see uh, this domain as being a banking site. Similarly, uh, we found a bug in uh, the way McAfee determines categorization. So we were able to um, register a domain called foo, which didn't even exist, foo.com. And we coerced any, any McAfee proxy into thinking, again, this is a banking site. So that would actually allow us to go on uh, and use these sites if we went in to register them uh, um, for our C2 or phishing sites. Um, so I'll give you a quick demo of uh, the Chameleon tool. Um, so basically what I'm doing here is uh, creating a new host. So I've created a new host called c2.apt1.info. Um, and just to prove that the, the host was old, so li as I said, I've literally just created it. We'll just do a quick uh, look up on it. Then um, I'm going to use Chameleon tool, the Chameleon tool, and I'm going to tell it to categorize this newly created host um, as, as finance or banking. So the first proxy it targets is uh, Bluecoat. And basically, we found a um, bug in um, the way Bluecoat does its verification, in that if you clone a certain site, and um, you made some subtle changes to the, uh, the page that you're cloning, um, when Bluecoat checks its category, it will go with whatever the original site was. So in this case, we've been able to trick it into thinking uh, that our site, our newly created host, is a financial services site. 
And we can go on and verify this by going to Bluecoat's website and we'll just pop in the, the new host, c2.apt1.info. And we'll now check out what category it thinks that Bluecoat Blue Coat thinks this is. And you can see it comes up as financial services. So now any user who's, any organization who's using Bluecoat as their corporate proxy will allow or, or will basically believe that c2.apt1.info is a financial services site. So I'm going to pass you back over to Vin, who'll talk about sandboxing. Right, so traditionally, um, antivirus has limitations due to the fact that it relies on signatures and basically poor heuristics. Um, so malware sandboxes have started to come about now as a way to allow for organizations to bring in the sort of like analysis process in an automated fashion into their organization. So you could go ahead and then buy one of these appliances and then start putting um, files in for it to then process and then tell you whether it's malicious or not. Um, so that sort of takes it away from um, ha having to use um, human analysts that go ahead and do that manually as well. Um, so, you know, it's quite um, useful, I guess. Um, but so the idea is like the file that you suspect is malware is then executed within an isolated and controlled environment. Um, there are cases where we have found that people have misconfigured it for whatever reason and the sandbox can connect out, which um, isn't the best sort of practice. Um, so what it does is it executes the file, examines what it does, and then it looks for these malicious indicators. Actually, go back a sec. Yeah, the malicious indicators. Um, so malicious indicators can be st um, actions such as reading from the registry, dropping a file to disk and executing it, or um, connecting out to a, um, a domain. Um, so, as a quick case study, I'm going to have a quick chat about FireEye um, MPS, the malware protection system. So, across a lot of organizations that we have seen FireEye being deployed, uh, the issues are generally due to the way like it's architectured or how it's placed within the organization and how it's being used as part of the, um, the security stack. Um, so, I was looking on the FireEye website. If you actually, so in the web MPS perspective, where you're actually scanning web links, um, we have found that you, like, HTTP would work fine, but there's actually a separate FireEye appliance that you're supposed to buy that allows you to then decrypt HTTPS traffic. So that, what this implies is that if you start sending links to a victim over HTTPS, it's not going to decrypt that, that, that payload and sandbox it. So there's like issues like that usually. Uh, across organizations. And another thing is usually due to the limitations in the sandbox itself. So the file types that it does sandbox um, are um, such as you know, executables and libraries or office mal malware documents, um, archives and shortcuts. So that's all great. We, we already sort of expect that to, um, you know, to, to sandbox that. But what we didn't really expect is that it doesn't sandbox HTML applications or JavaScript files. So these are quite commonly used now in like the wild, and you know if if the sandbox isn't um, putting the uh, processing these files, then it's sort of there's a this gap now in like what the technology are using to um, detect these sort of attacks. And another thing we found was that the FireEye MPS uses predefined guest images. So these guest images are actually updated um, every month or so. Um, so they stay on the website anyways. And then um, basically because they're predefined, anyone that can get one of these FireEye MPS boxes, they can go ahead and start reverse engineering it and look, uh, start looking into the sandbox environment. And then you can find items that you can key off of and not execute if you're in, within the sandbox. Um, yeah, and then because it's predefined, you can't really domain join these images, and if you can't domain join these images, it basically means that the image is never domain joined. All you have to do is make the payload not execute when you're in a, a non-domain joined environment. If you're in an enterprise environment, like, it's more likely that all the machines should be domain joined. Another sort of like um, detection thing that we've seen crop up quite recently is um, the idea of like next generation endpoint detection and response through solutions such as like Carbon Black. Um, so Carbon Black provides um, like security operation centers with the oversight of the process spawn chains. What I mean by process spawn chains, uh, such as like um, a, a parent and child 
sort of like relationship. So I'll talk a bit about a bit more about what I mean by that now. So quite a common one is like the mshta.exe, spawning powershell.exe. So the default payload in um, Empire and Cobalt Strike, as well as Metasploit Framework, which I think is the MSH, no, it's the HTA-PSH payload format, um, is like the, the container mshta.exe will spawn the powershell.exe um, process. So if you can detect this relationship, then you obviously know that something malicious is happening because why would someone open the mshta.exe container and start executing PowerShell unless you're doing it for malicious purposes? And then um, in terms of like command line login, we've noticed like an increase in like command line login. So um, such as looking for keywords like dash encoded command or any subset uh, substring of that up to around dash ENT. So uh, yeah, that's quite that's used quite often by threat actors to put a, a full payload stager in, inside the uh, a single command. Uh, also, like long PowerShell commands in the command line. If you're a developer or a sysadmin, you're more likely to just run PowerShell.exe and start right, um, executing commands from within the console as opposed to over the command line. So uh, more indicators lower. So now that I've talked about the sort of um, things that they might be looking out for, here's how you bypass them. So if they're looking for dash encoded command or dash encoded, one that's quite often overlooked is dash ec, so, because that's not a substring of dash encoded command. Um, I've also found that you can use um, Unicode characters in replacement for the dashes. So if they've got a regex going on for um, dash encoded command, um, if that dash is part of the regex, then if you're not using the ASCII dash anymore, you can um, you know, hopefully bypass that regex. So if you open the the character map and go to 2015, you can um, find that longer dash. There's actually a few more dashes that you can use, but I'll leave that to um, whoever's going to try and exploit this to find. Um, so what if we're looking for invoke expression or invoke web request? So um, quick explanation, invoke expression is the command that you use to execute a, a script block. And then the invoke web request is used to download um, Files off the um, off a URL. So here's a quick proof of concept that I've come up with. Um, this is just PowerShell executing PowerShell using the dot notation here in replacement for the invoke expression. And then here's the invoke web request. But instead of doing a web request, we're going to use um, NS lookup to do a DNS text record lookup. So this does a text record lookup for calc.vincentu.co.uk, which responds with calc.exe, and then the dot notation will execute that. Uh, more on this in a, in a little bit. Um, Daniel Bohannon has released um, Invoke Cradle Crafter a bit earlier on in the year. Uh, what this allows you to do quite easily is just supply it with a um, a target PowerShell script that you want to execute, and then it will create a cradle for you, like um, an obfuscated cradle, similar to what you would have used for um, traditional uh, sort of like staging of the code. Um, so what if they're detecting mshta.exe spawning powershell.exe like I spoke about before? Um, so Matt Nelson has made me aware that you could actually use the SWBEM locator com object to spawn um, the target process under like the WMI process, which is um, WMIPRVSE.exe. So then in that scenario, if you use this com object, it'll show up as WMIPRVSE.exe spawning the powershell.exe as opposed to mshta. So if they were looking for that parent and child relationship before, then you might not detect it anymore. Um, there's also a new moniker that you can now use to spawn it under <coughs> explorer.exe. Like, like, uh, Matt's also posted on his Twitter, so yeah, that will probably make it a bit more difficult for them to detect in the future. So um, at MDSEC, Dom's actually created a tool called um, PowerDNS, which allows you to stage a full payload over, entirely over DNS using a, a PowerShell DNS like sort of like download cradle. <laughs> as opposed to using um, the web web sort of like get request. Um, so traditionally, if you're using web requests, it might be blocked by proxy. But if you're doing it all over DNS, unless you've got like some DNS filtering going on, like automatically blocks domains, then it's not gonna it's not subject to um, categorization type issues. And if you're in a highly segregated um, area of the network, say you can only receive emails, but you can't actually access the internet to download a payload or, or whatnot. If you've attached that payload, then it's made it through all of like these sort of like defenses into a highly segregated area. 
the DNS might still be allowed out if um, you weren't able to connect out via HTTP. Um, so just going to show you a quick demo of the Power DNS tool now. Okay, so essentially what it's doing is it basically gives you um, a very short uh, kind of PowerShell one-liner, which you can then embed into your payload. Um, so in this case, we're just going to embed it into a HTA file. So you can see that the, the one-liner is very, very straightforward. Uh, it's, it could be something you could even type in if you wanted to. And then if we, uh, we run the HTA, what it'll do is it'll trigger a number of kind of DNS requests, um, which you can kind of see populating on the, on the left-hand side. Um, so the way it works is essentially there's a PowerShell script that's read in, uh, and it creates like a stager which it embeds in the first um, block of the um, DNS text record. Um, the, the, the download cradle will then retrieve that um, stager request and then use it to basically retrieve the rest of the PowerShell scripts. So effectively what it allows you to do is execute any PowerShell scripts over DNS completely. Uh, and in our, in our case, what I did was basically just grab a, um, a Cobalt Strike um, beacon um, stager, and, and you can see we've now got the, the implant on the left-hand side of the Cobalt Strike. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about command and control advances. Okay, right. So... Um, Domain fronting has actually been quite an interesting technique over the past 12 months. Uh, quite a lot of um, red teamers have started to look into this. I know quite a few red teams in the US that have started using this sort of technique. Um, I've actually quite recently, actually four days ago, I was looking on virus total for some of like the domains that I found, and I found like one guy was using it. So yeah, it's starting to uh, make its way out into the public, I guess. Um, so, Traditionally, domain fronting is being used as uh, in like the Tor um, Tor product, um, the Tor service, as a way to bypass uh, bypass censorship issues in certain countries. Uh, here, we're going to use it to mask our malicious infrastructure. So, we researched into the CloudFront CDN for um, uh, so Amazon's content delivery network for um, using the domain fronting technique. So, what you do for um, domain fronting is basically connect to any edge node and specify a host header of your specific node, and then it will grab the, um, the resources from your um, specific instance. Uh, so as a quick example, if you connected to a0.awsstatic.com, um, this will do a DNS um, lookup, and it will resolve to an Amazon Edge node. And then when you supply, it in, supply a host header in the HTTP request for your in, uh, my instance.cloudfront.net, and then look for that like, cat.jpg, it might not exist on a0.awsstatic.com, but it will actually grab it from my instance. So that lets me uh, basically hide it behind this domain. So, okay, uh, organizations using CloudFront might not want to use the CloudFront.net domain. So what do they do? They go ahead and use CNAME records to um, allow them to use their own domain instead of the one forced by um, the content delivery network. So this was quite interesting. If you set a CNAME record to um, GUID.CloudFront.net, um, it then basically lets you use it. So I went ahead and scanned the Alexa Top 1 million for um, CNAME records to the CloudFront Content Delivery Network. A uh, quick scan of the Top 1 million, um, there was 15,000-ish domains. Um, I've put li these all on my like GitHub page. So, so as a quick sample of like sort of domains that were, I was able to find, they were financial such as api.hsbc.com. Um, my favorite one was like, um, cdn.az.gov, that's like the Arizona government. Uh, and that was also one that I found that was being used like four days ago. There's the Bank of Melbourne. So there's quite a few interesting domains that you could use to mask your um, infrastructure. So uh, a few drawbacks with domain fronting is like it'll only work if the proxy is an RFC 2616 compliance, section 1423, which basically rewrites the, um, the, the, uh, the request. Um, we found an anomaly where um, Sophos Web Gateway didn't seem to be um, compliant, and yeah, so if you're up against Sophos Web Gateway, then you can just go ahead and um, use the domain fronting technique if you wanted to. Um, ideally, I usually say use domain fronting 
uh, after you've already infiltrated the organization using like um, the traditional C2 sort of thing. And then you can use this to establish long-term C2 if the main fronting would work. So after you've already infiltrated, it's a lot easier for you to do the internal recon to sort of like figure the configuration of the proxy and um, it, whether the domain fronting technique will work. Um, a lot of people have also said that like, if there's no um, root CA installed on the target machine, you can probably TLS the connection, so use HTTPS and it will work. Um, I found organizations where it's configured properly and it will drop the packets if it can't inspect it. So um, uh, yeah, so more for like um, after you've already infiltrated, then you can um, figure out whether it'll work sort of thing. Um, so here's a quick demo of the domain fronting sort of technique. Oops. Right, so on the left here, I begin like listing the DNS cache of the machine. So there's no like records there. I run the domain fronting payload. And on the right, we can immediately see uh, cdon.az.gov pop up. And it sticks it into the cache. Um, there's dev.usaspending.gov, and there's one more in the UK. Um, so you could actually create a payload that uses thousands of these domains, and it will send the like potentially send the blue team off on a wild goose chase trying to find all of these um, domains and block them. Well, that was just a quick test to make sure that I've got um, two AC2 and prove it. And then if you list it by DNS, you can actually see that like, every um, name is actually resolved to a different uh, edge node. So that means there's potentially more um, nodes that they'll have to block off if they're blocking by IP. Here's a quick um, view of the uh, yeah of the pay, uh, the comms itself. So it's connecting to probably like cdn.az.gov, but anyways an edge node, and that's my particular um, CloudFront instance, like uh, my malicious instance, and it's grabbing like the activity um, sort of like resource, and then it returns uh, with the comms. So um, I'm just going to talk about lateral movement now. So lateral movement techniques have pretty much been reduced to um, PX exec, uh, WMI, PowerShell remoting, RDP. Um, so they're pre pretty useful techniques. Um, but we found situations where you might be in like a sandboxed environment, which doesn't allow out um, like outbound communications to the rest of the network. So sysadmins can only like RDP into the DMZ perhaps, and you've compromised something inside the DMZ. So if you wanted to like attack outwards from the DMZ, then you might use a technique such as like this one. So um, RDP, when you connect into a target machine, you could mount your drives. And if you mount your drives on your disk, it basically exposes this backslash backslash TS client backslash C drive on the um, target um, session inside the RDP session. And then you can then drag and drop files like back and forth between your host machine and the the the, um, the, um, the server. So that's quite useful. And um, quite a lot of people use like sysadmins might use that like, to um, drop updates into the environment if they needed to. Um, so what we created was an RDP inception. Um, you basically put this into the startup folder of the RDP session. So you've compromised this web app or this database, and then um, you start deploying this sort of like technique. Next time the sysadmin logs in with mount, uh, drives mounted, it will infect his machine. So it'll infect his machine. The next time he logs in, um, you'll get a shell on his machine. So he's only, so between him and the, the target environment, he's only allowed 3389 inwards. So you, you wouldn't have been able to attack outwards in any other way using like, the network. Um, so this sort of like worms upwards and infects. So here's a quick um, diagram. Uh, we're down here. Uh, we're establishing C2 over like a redirector. We've compromised this database server. And this database server can't see any, any of this. So it can't connect outwards to any of these machines. But the file server, or any, like maybe even this, could connect in via 3389. So that's amazing. And then there's this systems admin over here. He's at home and he's ad, um, VPNed in maybe and then RDPing into a jump box, RDPing into the domain controller for whatever reason. It's theoretical. And then um, he RDPs into the file server and finally into the database. So if in these steps he mounts his drives, like say from the file server into the database server, then 
list technique would work in such a way where it will infect this server, and then if he has mount drives mounted here, it will infect list and then eventually loop all the way upwards. By this point at the file server, you might already, it might be like an internal file server. You might already be in a position on the network where you can begin attacking these um, other sort of um, um, assets in the organization. So just to get an understanding of how like uh, applicable this sort of technique is, uh, I surveyed around 127 people in the InfoSec community. I basically put up a poll on Twitter. Around 30% said they um, did mount the drives at least once or twice in their life. So um, it is quite applicable. I think even more for sysadmins where they have to dr drag and drop um, updates into the environment maybe. Um, so pass you back on to Dom to talk about. This. Um, so if you've done any kind of red teaming, you're probably familiar with a tool called Bloodhound. Um, I couldn't really not mention it because it's one of the biggest advances in kind of red team tactics that have come to light in the past 12 or so months. It's also one of our kind of favorite tools. Um, so Bloodhound basically um, allows you to um, query a lot of, retrieve a lot of information from AD, um, things like user sessions, uh, group memberships, uh, local admin, um, rights and um, basically it will use this information to provide a visual mapping of the AD environment. Um, so this visual mapping will actually allow you to better understand your uh, AD infrastructure um, but it will also allow you to actually identify past to escalate privileges um, based on the relationships between all these kind of objects. Um, so let's if we look at a quick example, let's say we've um, fished a user called Alice and Alice is a member of the, the help desk group um, and that help desk group is also a member of the support group. Now that may not be immediately obvious to you when you kind of uh, compromise Alice's machine. Um, and what also may not be obvious to you straight away is that the support group has actually got admin rights on something like maybe the SharePoint server. And at that given time, there's a domain admin logged on to the SharePoint server. So um, that basically gives us a very quick um, path to escalate privileges to DA. Now, um, Bloodhound will actually uh, retrieve all this information and produce um, a graph that's something that something looks a little bit similar to this. Uh, and it's actually got multiple paths to actually go from uh, the Alice user up here to the domain admin down here. So if we think about that uh, fictitious case that I just mentioned, we can see Alice is a member of the, um, the help desk group, which is a member of the support group, which uh, has got admin rights to the SharePoint server, which has got a domain admin logged on. Um, so we could basically use this information to very quickly go from a normal user to um, domain admin. Um, but it didn't really stop there. So in May this year, um, the developers of Bloodhound released another major update, which basically then used um, uh, access control entities or access control lists as a, a, of an additional attack path for privilege escalation. So um, specifically now Bloodhound will map out um, all the ACLs for all AD objects and it will attempt to identify potentially misconfigured um, access control entities that can be used for privilege escalation. Um, so these include um, things like the, the force uh, change password attribute which will basically allow you to change the password of a target user uh, without knowing the current value. So this is typically things Things that you might see implemented on like help desk objects or um, that you know that are implemented within AD. Um, it may there's also it'll also find things like the um, the generic rights attribute, which basically allows you to update um, any kind of non-protected target object. Um, so you could uh, update something like the script path parameter, which will basically allow you to configure a command that gets executed the next time that user kind of logs on. Um, so. We're always kind of interested in um, automating a lot of the things that we um, do on Red Team exercises, mainly for implementing, you know, streamlining, um, you know, implementing and speeding up our, our kind of exploitation process. Because you never know how quickly the blue team are going to find you and kind of kick you off the network. So um, Vincent actually went and developed a tool called Angry Puppy. And what Angry Puppy does is it's basically a Cobalt script Strike aggressor script, which will um, allow you to import some of the... Um, the Bloodhound JSON export. So um, you can identify a particular attack path within Bloodhound. Um, you can export the JSON and then you can import it into Cobalt Strike. And then Angry Puppy will automatically execute that for you. So you don't ha actually have to manually need to log on to all the systems, like dump the hashes, dump the passwords from those systems, reuse them to log on to the, the next node in the chain. Um, Angry Puppy will automatically do this for you and it will kick back a uh, kind of SMB beacon on each of those systems. 
And then I believe uh, they're, they're planning to implement um, the, uh, currently it only supports the kind of credential retrieval, but they're planning to implement the kind of misconfigured ACLs in the future. Um, so we'll give you a quick uh, demo of the Angry Puppy tool. Right. So this is an attack path that we've decided to execute. You know, so from the desktop user to desktop support, I export the JSON for um, in uh, Bloodhound. So I've exported it, go back into Cobalt Strike, go to the um, target session, type in Angry Puppy. I then can just select, select the JSON file that I want to, um, the attack path that I want to execute, um, choose the sort of like lateral movement technique and the um, comms, and I just like run it. And it'll go ahead and execute this for me. So this is more useful in larger sort of like attack paths where um, it can execute it in minutes as opposed to um, if you were doing it manually, it might take a bit longer and you've got like human error involved as well. So yeah, so now it's finished executing the attack path and ob obtained access to the um, support group. Okay, so um, so what's next? Well, while the past kind of 12 months or so have been pretty exciting from a red team perspective, um, the advances in blue team tactics have meant that we need to continually keep evolving. Um, so personally, I think we'll start to see more research into uh, defensive evasion, uh, particularly things like um, device guard, credential card. They'll come under more scrutiny as um, organizations start to, you know, Windows 10 becomes more widely adopted. Um, and then generally speaking, I really kind of expect the area of red teaming to grow further. So perhaps we'll see um, the increase in more sector-specific frameworks, so things similar to the CBEST and uh, TIBA and ICAST schemes that I mentioned, but um, outside of finance, maybe targeting um, you know, something like power or, or, or other kind of sectors. Uh, and finally, we'd just like to say thanks really to... Um, all the kind of researchers uh, that we mentioned in our talk. So you can find, uh, you can follow some of these guys on Twitter. They're always kind of kicking out interesting stuff. Um, all the tools that we talked about, in, in addition to some others, um, are available on the MDSEC Active Breach uh, GitHub page where you can kind of use them in your own red team exercises. Um, so any, any questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. So uh, if anyone's got anything they want to ask, feel free. Any questions? Or maybe questions off the stage, maybe during lunchtime, which happens uh, right after this. Well, thank you very much, then. Dominic, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you.